Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, a Paramount Podcast Network. I am Mike Casaza. Welcoming in for the first time since the spring game, Chris Anderson. We have not really spoken since Saturday. Um, Neil Brown ran the clock a little bit. You had to work overtime, do some little league. We never got to share thoughts. You had yours online. I had mine a day later. Eh, some time has passed here, but I don't know. As you've gone through what I wrote, that I'm sure you read. Uh, I absolutely read what you wrote afterwards. New thoughts. Of, any new thoughts in yours about, I don't know, Saturday, the first 14 practices, what happens now, the, the 2021 season, anything new inside that noggin of years? I don't know if it's anything new from from what I thought the other day. Um and because I don't know how many uh, disclaimers we put on that. What can you take from the spring game thing? There's a few things to notice, a few things to thought, put it in there on the, on the written thing, just like you did. And I, nothing's changed in my opinion. Like I, I, I still feel okay about the offense. Like when you see the plays and you see how guys are doing, that's one thing, but the thing that stood out to me most, and I guess actually, I guess I didn't put this in written form because it didn't happen until afterwards was were the comments from the players that had a bigger impact on me than anything I saw that actually happened on the field. The the comments that the players were making afterwards about the confidence, the swagger, and you wrote about this, um, you know, in the play calling. And it seems like they truly believe that and, and believe that this offense can make a big play. And it sounds to me like, this offense and the play calling from Graham Harrell is going to be more of a let's go out and score. Let's make a big play. We're going to go for the end zone instead of, as we saw a lot of times these past three years, let's just try not to screw up. And that's the kind of sense you got from the offense. And I think that's changed after the spring game, not necessarily because of what I saw during the game. Everybody likes to throw it during the spring game, but because of what the players said afterward. I'm with you. And one thing here, here's my two. One, you said nothing has changed. I, I like that with a spin. The two things I find, and they kind of go back to your point. One, people really want this to work now. I think the off season has been very positive for them as far as addressing the problem, understanding it, attempting to fix it. And that came out through some of those comments. You're right. And that was not stuff like, Hey, Caden Prather was the offense conservative last year. He came out and said it. He wasn't asked. It was just like, hey, what's different about the offense? And he kind of went on about it. Um, even Dante Still said the offense is attacking. They're using their weapons. James Gamitter, um, they're not hesitant or reserved. They're not being conservative. They're being aggressive. They're trying to move the ball and score. That's cool. And I think a lot of that is now that people want to see it work because all the goodwill, all the PR stuff, whatever you want to call it, we, I've, I know I've kind of come around on how Neil Brown had some really good days in the offseason here where he maybe didn't have to and – I think he won some fans or maybe got people to take his side of the fork in the road for his program. We've been over that. So people do want to see it work. However, there is a similar quantity of people who are also like, I need to see it work too. And they kind of level each other out on the whole scale of, of football fandom justice here where, yeah, everybody wants to see it work. If you're a fan on the other side of the people, like I'm tired of waiting. I need to see it. I'm tired of wanting, I need results. And I don't think that changed at all Saturday. I think people are maybe enthusiastic or optimistic or somewhere in between, but also realistic. Like, eh, we'll see. Um, and then I had a conversation with somebody who would have been Sunday morning about stuff after I published three things kind of in my in my messages on the website. And a pretty good person said that the difference is, like, if you listen to what everybody said about Graham Harrell and some of the things that he said from day one, even about, hey, we want to score every time. And you go back to Jared Parker, which was we just trying to find a way to win by one, which is true. There's a gulf of, of confidence and swagger or whatever in between those two poles from coaches. And you can tell which way the players want to go. And I hadn't thought about it in that perspective, but like it's a heck of a bookend too. we're trying to score every time that we're trying to win by one. Which one do you think the players like the most? And then to that point, which one do you think the fans like the most too? Um, pretty obvious answer there. Yeah, once you get to – if you could have an offense that's just trying not to screw up and is actually trying to score points, granted there might be a little more volatility in that, but it also might help cover up if you're able to hit those big plays, if you're able to score an extra touchdown or, or turn a field goal into a touchdown on a couple drives – 
that can help mask some of the other problems that you have on this team, some of the other, uh, you know, inefficiencies that you might have, uh, holes you might have, and like in the secondary, we can talk about that in another podcast. But um, West Virginia is going to need all the points they can get this year, I think. It begins with the offense, and here's why we are here, Chris. We're going to quickly go through offensive too deep slash roster thoughts. We'll follow with a separate episode on the defense. And then, actually, we have a pretty good idea. We'll save until the end of how we're going to do it. Don't want to distract you too much. Pay attention to this content. Um, and I guess we'll begin at quarterback as we try to look at who goes where and how many people they have at certain spots. I think we both agree QB1 is not yet here. Probably will be in May, it sounds like. He graduates on a Saturday, and the May semester begins two days later at WVU. So that's possible that JT Daniels is here pretty early in the offseason. The other part about it is no rush. Guy's been in this for a while. Physically, maybe keep him on ice a little bit. Mentally, he can look at a playbook and, and refresh himself. But I'm pretty sure that if not day one, then soon after, he's going to kind of be nudged toward QB1. How do you rank and file the remaining three quarterbacks, not based on Saturday, but based on Saturday as the last of the 15 practices and, and what seemed like a spectrum of progression for all three passers? Yeah, because the fact that we the fact that we didn't get an answer this spring gave us our answer for QB1. Uh, so I'm with you. Yeah, Daniel's number one. And based off the comments, it's it's such a strange kind of up and down because Throughout most of the spring, we had both been hearing that Garrett Green had been the most consistent or the best performer throughout the entirety of the spring, the, the first 14 practices. And then you get to the spring game and Will Crowder, who I don't want to say had been forgotten, but, you know, everybody, hey, Green, Green, we've seen a couple times before. We've seen in game situations and then and you've seen some of the excitement that you can get with him, a couple big throws, a couple big runs. And then there's the shiny new toy in Nico Marchio. And in, and in between there is Crowder, who's kind of like that lost middle child. And he ends up being pretty clearly the best performer during the game on, on Saturday. And Neil Brown even said afterwards that that was the best he has thrown the ball the entire spring. So how much do you take into that? If you have 14 meh to bad practices and then one great one, but it, the one great one is when it matters, quote unquote, most, I guess, out, out of these 15. What do you take from that? And I'm not sure which way you go here. And and here's here's the other angle. Will it work itself out because of the transfer portal? Yeah. Part of me wants to say that it's or, or, or as the backup. Yeah. And then part of me wants to say it's or for the backup <laughs> because it's only going to be probably two of them there. And then that's just going to be based on what the coaches think and the conversations they have, but also what the player and his, his people, his family, his coaches back home, um, his, whatever conduit that person has to the transfer portal or other destinations, what do they think? Cause it's going to be a collective conversation there. The number that strikes me is the number of passes that Crowder threw uh, 12 for each team. It's 24 passes. That's a pretty busy day in a spring game. They threw 50, 58. Um, and you got some, Cavalera, Robbins, Chris in there too, but only I think five or six. So those first three quarterbacks do a lot of passes, which is kind of what we said in the preview. I hope they get to air it out and, and show what they've been working on. And they did and look good in spots too. Um, Crowder did seem like he had a good, a better grasp when I understood about him. I just hadn't seen him a lot. Every time I was out there, it was either Green or Marchio. That was the number one, just by the way the schedule worked out. But Crowder, for the first time I saw him extended, was pretty, I mean, there was something there definitely. He had some good touch. And then a lot of his incomplete passes – he just made decisions to get rid of the ball, throw it out of bounds, keep it safe. Um, I think he had one or two drops that weren't his fault or maybe passes that weren't perfect, but percentage is probably better than what it was when you consider that some of those incompletes weren't necessarily on him. Never put the ball in danger. Looked fine. I think that's something that you can certainly work with there if he sticks around. Marquio's got talent. There's no doubt about that. I like to see him run the ball. Green. The one thing I can't get past with Green is the is the the way that he's commented upon in the coaching. And this may be going back to last year and how they just know how to handle him because he's a competitive kid. You know, last year, they were hard on him about certain things, about got to run the play, can't go off script. And and this year, it's not the same, but, you know, hey, his highs aren't as high as the other guys. And then he responded. He had some highs in the next time we saw him. And he, and he did again and early in the first and second halves on Saturday. But yet the late criticism of him or the late coaching of him has been he can't force it. You know, he's got to understand every play can't be a big play. He's got to take what's there sometimes. And you talk about, you know, 
Crowder kicking it out of bounds or checking it down or Marquio running or doing something there. And there were times where Green could have done something similar, gotten into a back or a tight end. I think even on the interception, he might have had something shorter underneath. I have to go back and look at it. But that's where they're at with him, which makes me wonder if they're a little bit further down the road with him. Not necessarily that they're low on him. Maybe they're high on him and they think, like, listen, if we're going to get him in here, we need him to understand and accept these things here, too. Again, that's kind of an inkblot test. Are they hard on him because they don't like what they see? Or are they hard on him because might need you? You might be our number two. You might be the guy that gets in there and does some stuff. And we'll see on that. It's just a matter of how they pitch it to him, but also how does he take it. But I, I didn't have any problem with Green apart from that interception, which bad play. But, I mean, that's a pretty teachable moment that right there. Hey, when there's a free safety hovering above your slot going deep on a corner, maybe don't throw that ball. Should you have to learn that on tape in a spring game? No, but that's an easy one to coach him through. And the other thing we have to remember, and, and I know it's a little hard on him for his performance there, is that of the three quarterbacks, four if you include Daniels, he is the strongest runner. The spring game is not meant for running quarterbacks. They were not going to run him. They were not really, and they kind of dabbled a little bit with with a couple of the guys running, especially Marchio, and wanting to get him going. But the quarterbacks, for the most part, are not going to be actually running and getting tackled, scrambling, all that stuff during the spring game. And and something else I was told is he that was especially true for Green. And actually, I don't even know if I've told you this yet, Mike, but I heard that he took some kind of accidental knock to the noggin, not like a concussion type knock, but did end up giving him stitches. And so they really wanted to keep him from getting hit even more than you normally would with a quarterback. Breaking news. Breaking, breaking news. I mean, I, I very light. Like, I, I think my understanding was just a, a couple stitches from a little bit of a gash, not a big deal. So, okay, fair enough. Speaking of run game, not meant for the spring game, you have the rushing attack. They definitely poured their reps and their focus on the quarterbacks, but they have these four running backs that you want to know about. And I just, apart from Matt, that's being the number one, which wasn't questioned before and certainly isn't after. I, I do wonder about the number two because I did see something out of one of the players that was encouraging and something they wanted him to do. But I also liked what I saw from two other players. And I wonder if this isn't or, or, or as a backup because Lynn J. Dixon is not Jalen Anderson, is not Justin Johnson. But there's something to that about having that versatility. Um, again, the, the idea of having a backup here seems kind of goofy because you have three guys who can combine to give you whatever the heck you need out of a backup or a number two or a platoon or 20 personnel. Um, didn't see a whole lot of it. Can't draw a whole lot of conclusions. Like personally, I would like to have seen Lynn J. Dixon get more than three touches. Um, but also I would like to have seen Anderson get more than seven carries because he looked good at the times that he was out there running. And I understand what you have with, with Mathis, but um, the passing game for the receivers was there, but not for the running backs. That was curious. I wrote about this in three things. I'm really intrigued by the running back position, not because of what we saw, but because of what we didn't see and why I suspect that is the case. And I think there's a starter. I think there's backups and probably no order there. Okay. So we're, we're in agreement that Mathis is the starter. Yes. yes. Okay. I, I'm with you. Cause I think when he got more opportunities at the end of last year, he ran like a man possessed. And I think, He's going to get the first shot as a starter. And I'm with you that behind him, it's probably going to be or, or, or. You'll see guys split reps at the beginning of the year. And I, I think they'll pare it down and figure it out as the season goes along because they are all different types of backs. But I'm not so sure yet that any one of them is definitively better than the other two options. So uh, I think you'll see them try some things out. I, I'm with you on Anderson. Uh, he's going to be frustrating for the coaches because we've seen or heard that, you know, they, they've kind of been on him about his weight. They have been talking about him being overweight for eight months now, seven months now. This is one of the reasons why I said, you know, I thought he might be third or fourth on the depth chart when we did a podcast like a month ago. It's just, it was concerning to me that they're still talking about him being overweight when he's been in the program and with the strength and conditioning staff for, seven, eight months and still hasn't figured that part out. So hopefully he gets that under control, gets that figured out, because if he looks the way he did in that spring game while being overweight, imagine what he can do once he gets into the shape that the coaching staff wants him in. Mm -hmm. He's more like Mathis than Johnson and Dixon. Johnson and Dixon are more like one another than Mathis or Anderson like them. I guess if I think about it too – 
probably more likely that Anderson ends up as the odd man out at this moment, but there is potential there too. Um, I think they might have kept the cover on Dixon just because, like, let's get him in early. This guy doesn't need another spring. And, oh, he did some good things, you know, in the spring. Let's make sure it doesn't get wild in the spring game. I think he's part of 20 personnel packages, but the receiving skills are evidently there. Johnson looked good, too, in pass protection, which is one of those things that they've hit him on before. If you remember last year, you're like, you can't play this guy. He can't stand up in the blitz. Okay, he was willing to do that, too. So, again, if they're going to have guys back there in, in receiving routes or if they're going to have guys back there, you know, doing more than just running the ball, pass protection is one, but also run blocking for the other running back if they're serious about doing 20 personnel. I think that's pretty encouraging there, too. But I'm with you. Um, Anderson's got a way to go, but if he does get it, there's, you can just tell he's got got something the other guys don't have. He's more like Mathis, but he's not he's not Mathis either, too. Receivers, this seems pretty easy for me right now. You're going to have Wheaton. And Fox on one side, you'll have Prather and Jarrell Williams on the other. In the slot, and they're probably just one slot position right now, you're going to have James and Reese Smith being back. Grayson Malashevich can float around in there, too. In a couple of weeks, months, they'll add. This is how it's going to work, I guess. Bram is going to be your outside guy. Aaron's your inside guy. If they add somebody else, that's fine. But um, I, this this kind of seems like open and, open and closed case right now where the receivers are and who's the starter and who's the backup. Agreed wholeheartedly. I think they'll they'll stick with, and this is something you've you've written about extensively this off season, That maybe it's best that they go with essentially four, maybe five receivers instead of trying to rotate in eight and splitting reps amongst everybody. And maybe the offense will be better off for it if they focus on like four or five guys. Feel better if Reese Smith has a whole spring too. Yeah, I think that that hamstring really set him back. I think he missed. What it's five weeks long and he missed two. He missed almost literally half of it. So it's a rough go of him. And it, it, but then again, he was. I think it, they put him out there with essentially the second team offense and threw to him on the first play and threw to him a couple of more times. So somebody that still seems to be part of this offense, but yeah, really, really set him back by missing half the spring. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see like Williams apparently again played a lot, had some good moments, but just doesn't look the same as the other guys who've been there longer and are, are stronger and just know how to run routes and get open in college. Nothing against him, but that's why a guy like Bram could be important because you don't have to play Williams as much. And if you're playing Williams and Preston Fox, no no offense to Preston Fox, but need to see it with the lights on, and it may happen. Um, you're kind of uh, sorry, hamstrung so to speak by what guys haven't done yet. You get some junior college guys in there that that have some experience and success. That'll be. That'll be a break for the offense that they could certainly use too. Offensive line, all right, four fifths we know. Left to right, it's going to be Milam, Gemitter, Frazier, and Nestor. I guess our first question is: Is it already Jaquay Hubbard time, or is this a competition that goes into the preseason because you can't discount the time that Yates missed? You can't hold that against him when you're asking him to also learn the right side after playing on the left. He needs to be on the field to do that. He wasn't. That's not all his fault. Yeah, can you clarify for me who who was right tackle at the start of the game of the spring game? Was it not Hubbard? That's what I'm asking you. I, I thought it because I think at first I thought it was Hubbard, and then I came out and I said, "Oh no, wait, that's actually uh, Yates." And then I went back and forth on it because it was number fifty, which is Yates. Mm-hmm. And he was out there for the first snap. Was he wearing the penny? No, not at the start of the game. He was he was it was number 50 and he was out there with the first team offense. And I just couldn't believe it because I was under the impression that he wasn't playing. Let me look at my notes here. Uh, Yeah, I've actually crossed out 66 and written in 50. He was your first team offense. OK, so now, I don't I don't I don't know because I I. I'm with you. I thought it was trending towards Hubbard and it certainly seemed that way based off some of the comments that Neil Brown had made and talked about, you know, injuries kind of setting him back and that the competition would continue into the fall. And I believe my comment was, is that Neil Brown just kind of running cover for the fact that Hubbard has just won this competition and he just doesn't want to say it yet. And not trying to say there's anything nefarious in that, just that, hey, you know, sometimes when guys get lose their job, you don't want to come out and promote it, that they might have lost their job. But And so I was kind of assuming that that is what happened. And maybe I was wrong. Maybe it will still be Yates. Well, this makes three things that have my attention about Brandon Yates right now. One, he started the spring game at right tackle one, which I did not know. I guess I knew because I wrote it down, but I had not let that sink into my memory. But between that 
and the fact that he did play on the second team, like he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think he played a snap at guard. No. Which was kind of maybe something that we made a bigger deal out of. I asked I asked Matt Moore about it in practice one day and ended up writing a story about it, but that seemed like an important swing guy they could put in the middle if he wasn't going to be a right tackle. But I don't think they're ready to close the gate on right tackle right now. Because, again, if he wasn't around, how can you really have a fair like evaluation of him at a new position, especially when Hubbard you just don't know about? So why why cut the tape right now? Let it go and see what, see what happens, who responds, who you can get maybe. Um, so I would say that's that's up in the air, 50-50. Maybe it's 55-45. We'll see. But the fact that they started Yates in addition to playing him on both sides, I think they were trying to speed him up and get some reps. Now here's the question. Was it a, a prove it or lose it moment for him? Because they know what they have in Hubbard or Hubbard had such an impressive spring to them. And that, hey, Yates, we're kind of we're going to we're going to consolidate your spring into one game here a little bit. Do something with it. And then how did he do? Uh, he was OK. I didn't have a problem with the way he played. I don't think they had a whole lot of pressure packages in there, but there were times they were kind of trying to come around the outside and he slid out and did what he's supposed to do on the right side. That's good, too. Um, here's where things get interesting, though. If Hubbard is your right tackle, fine. Yates can be your right tackle. He could also be one of your guards. We, we, under, we understand that to be the case because. Matt Moore likes guys who play on the same side. Well, he's played left and right. Once he gets through this whole right tackle experiment, he could be a backup there. Nick Malone's kind of the same, though. Nick Malone is kind of sneaky athletic is what I've heard. And, and now that I've heard that, I've seen it. And like, OK, I can buy that uh, bigger, too. Like that guy looks like he's finally hit the weight room and, and kept the weight, which is good. That's an inside guy who could maybe play outside as well. And then Jordan White's a center guard, too. So this is going to be interesting because it's one of those things where, all right, if Yates gets hurt, or excuse me, if Hubbard starts, Yates gets in at right tackle. But like, let's say that Nestor rolls an ankle and has to come out. Who's your guard? Is probably White, but maybe Yates is good enough as an inside guy because I think he's more of a natural guard. Um, how they rank six, seven, and eight, or how they get those guys onto the field based on who might come out and necessitate a substitute, that to me is the bigger question. I don't think one through four is any... My bad. I hit my microphone there. I don't think one through four is any question. Five is going to sort itself out. But what they do is six, seven, and eight, and how they choose to get those people in the field, that's really the the one thing I'm paying most attention to. And I just don't know if there's anybody else beyond those eight guys right now in the in that rotation. Um, for the whatever it's worth, the spring game roster, when, you know, they, they didn't say this, but they said it. It, it was a depth chart. It was a first team offense versus first team defense, second team offense, second team defense, so on. The seven offensive linemen that were with the first team offense were the five guys we mentioned, the returning starters, Milam, Gamitter, Frazier, Nestor, Yates. The two others, which presumably are, quote, in the rotation, White and Hubbard. Those were the two guys that, that you know, they had there with working, rotating in with that first team. Again, who knew, who knows what that means as far as the spring game goes, but those were the two, uh, you know, when, when Matt Moore is talking about he needs seven, eight, would like nine, you know, realizes that 10 is unrealistic, but would love it. So those are the two guys that, that they had rotating in with that first team. And then your candidates beyond that, uh, Tomas Rematch had been playing guard. I did not see him. He was out late in the spring with some sort of an injury. Um, yeah, he was on the sideline. Okay. Didn't see him. Um, Tyler Conley is an inside guy, center. He's not your backup center. Bryce Biggs probably still a year away. Um, Dylan Ray, they said, is a year away. Uh, Donovan Beaver is still here and, and just hasn't hasn't hit the field and done anything to think that he could be a guy. So when they talk about the true freshman coming in, if they're if they can pick up the speed – they can play because they're big enough. They probably mean that. Like there could be a guy who, I mean, certainly plays four games, I would think. But like I'm not sure as an everyday guy in there. But if they need depth, I wonder if they don't just pour it into a true freshman. One thing that we'll see. All right. Uh, once again, Chris, we fixed it. All right. Are, are we skipping over tight end? You know I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I know you wouldn't do that to long snapper. But I don't even know if there's much. Is there much to talk about a tight end? Because I feel like it's it's not quite the what do they they called it the SUV room that it was where they just had a bunch of different body types. But it seems like it's going to be Palindi in a lot of packages, O'Laughlin in a lot of receiving packages, and then hoping that some of these other guys develop to to help build depth and then take over in the future. 
of Auckland moving around without an eight brace or anything right now too. seen him yeah. about town. And I mean, apparently he's been working to the side on some stuff too. So he's getting closer. If they can get him back, that, that situation takes care of itself. Davis looks like he doesn't mind mixing, mixing it up. Uh, Wickstrom is probably the same too. I just saw more of Davis, but um, if they have four people there who they can play, they don't have to worry about red shirt implications on two guys. Like they were, they were kind of handcuffed last year with that about, we don't want to play these guys more and who knows what they might've become, but they didn't need to. Uh, maybe they don't need to as much now, but it's a different situation where you can play somebody and don't have to worry about squandering a season because of Palendi. Um, if they get O'Loughlin back and he's in good shape and he's got a proper run into the season, I don't really have a lot of concerns about that spot. It's not going to be a productive position, but um, we also saw them playing slot too, which is maybe more of an indication of the receiver depth than tight end skill, but that's something that they could get away from if they get some different receivers. Um, again, once they arrive over the summer too, but uh, I'm not I'm not too concerned about that spot. Yeah. No, no, no. All right. Well, now we fixed it. Once again, questions asked, questions answered. That's what we do here. We will come back um, later in the week with an episode on the defensive depth chart. But first, Chris, our idea. We're going to draft. Uh-huh. People love drafts this time of year, this time of the month. What we'll do, we'll flip a coin. Either Chris or I will go first. I guess snake draft, you'll call it one, two, two, one. But we're going to pick first team offenses and defenses. So with the first pick, Chris takes blank. Well, with my first pick, I take blank. He might take JT Daniels. Well, then who do I take with my first pick? I'm going to take, I don't know, could be Charles Woods, could be Zach Frazier. We'll see. But then we're going to exercise all of our picks and try to figure out what a team might look like based on how we draft available players. That means they're on the roster or incoming in the recruiting class. However, as awesome as this idea sounds, as original as it is, we're going to wait. Um, because it's that time of year, Chris. Post-spring, you got that May 1 deadline coming around. Um, people in the portal, if they want to be eligible next season, that's the date they have to circle them. But also, and you can talk about this if you want to, may have some additions here before too long. Yep, got a couple transfers coming in this weekend. Uh, Lockhart, the defensive lineman from Georgia Tech. Uh, Austin Cave, the linebacker from Miami, tells me he's trying to set that up and, and get in. So could be, um, you know, you add those couple, that could really shake things up and add a lot of depth to that that front seven. So that'd be our plan. Sometime probably after that May 1 deadline, we'll come back. We'll flip a coin. Someone goes first. Pick your presumably your quarterback. That's the way it goes. But then, hey, who's your number one pick if you have the number two pick in the draft? And then I guess you have the number two, you have the number three, too. So that's where the fun begins. But we won't start that one until a couple of days from now. Um, so stay tuned, see how it goes and see. Uh, I typically don't fare very well on these things, if I remember correctly. So let's see if I can change my luck on that one. Until then, I'm Mike Casaza, And I'm Chris Anderson. We'll talk to you later.